This episode of Dirty Linen is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. If you can be creative in hospitality and like in food, I think that it's the ultimate industry. I don't think there's a better, like there's a better industry to be in. If you know, if you can be really creative. Yeah, I'm very optimistic that there's so many great ideas out there that are slowly like coming to fruition. You know, it's getting pretty creative and interesting out there. This week on Dirty Linen, we are switching gears and discussing good things, optimism, stuff that's going well, people that have pivoted and pirouetted and it's all turned out dandy and I'm really thrilled to begin these discussions with Charlie Carrington from Atlas Dining in Melbourne and now Atlas Masterclasses and Charlie I was looking back well first of all welcome welcome to my podcast thank you very much I was looking back, I wanted to find, think when it was that um, I wrote an article about you right at the start of the pandemic and it was just about a year ago, it was, I think it was like this, right at the start of April and you were just preparing to do your very first food boxes with some videos that you were uh, sending out to people because we were all at the start of lockdown, we had no idea what was going on but we knew we needed to do stuff and um, yeah, here we are a year and two weeks later and... It's really turned into something, hasn't it? Yeah, it's um, you know, like who would have who would have thought <laughs> what, what it's become? Um, yeah, when we started, sort of, yeah, the end of March and start of April, really, was once it started going, you know, to now, like, you know, it's been probably you know one of the biggest learning curves. So we, yeah, we've been going for just over a year now, and yeah, it's been a you know absolute hell of a ride. I guess you know that period at the start of the pandemic, everybody was, I guess, switching to takeaway and just wondering what the hell to do. Were they going to be making passata? Were they going to be boxing up meats you know were they going to be doing stuff on zoom like what was it going to be uh, can you talk about your thought process yeah to give some context to that sort of time you know we naturally were sort of just working ourselves out what are we going to do and um i knew that we didn't want to just do our restaurant menu at home so i was very much talking to my girlfriend about you know what are we going to do and you know and this is very stressful time because not only was like the restaurant's you know, worried about what's going to happen, but everyone was cancelling bookings and, you know, it was getting very, very scary very quickly. And um, so my girlfriend actually sent me a text message one night um, suggesting what she thought is basically what the mask class sort of is. And that's really how it started. So I thought, you know, we may as well just have a crack and try something completely different. And that was really sort of how it all began. And were you, uh, like, how were you feeling? Were you feeling ex- like- oh, I was, yeah like I think the the general consensus including myself was like it was a lot of panic because you know everyone you know hospitality you've obviously you're serving guests you need people in the restaurant and like a lot of restaurants especially places that don't adapt as well to take away and usually, you know, usually don't do takeaway. They're not going to, like, you're not really ready for a pandemic, if that makes sense. <laughs> so, yes. you know, like, I feel like, you know, if you had a takeaway shop, you know, it's probably a little bit easier to, to just go harder on that side of the business as opposed to maybe the indoor dining. And, you know, it's still hard, but it's not, yeah, where, like, you know, our food, it just would not translate, I don't believe, at home. So that was really why we thought, well, let's just, um, you know, let's just have a crack at this and something that we thought maybe would translate at home. But I definitely didn't think it would be anywhere near as successful as it was and has been. So give us a scale, give us a sense of how well it's done. So, yeah, so week one, um, when we started, we were able to, like, we were literally doing more takings than the restaurant was in week one. And then from there, we've grown, especially like during the second lockdown, like it got to the point where we had 65 staff who were just packing the boxes and helping us assemble them. Um, and since then, we've obviously got a lot more efficient as well. So that's probably helped because in those days, we were prepping every single thing from scratch in Caulfield. So it was very, very manual and um, which is fine at the start, but like I can't explain how labor intensive that can be assembling thousands of different items and packing them all, you know, really nicely. And then now, um, and then until now we've really come out of the pandemic and we've, you know, I almost would say we've had to sort of get, you know, not re-pivot, but to really work out like what the market is now. And I feel like, um, you know, once the 
the pandemic stopped, I feel like most people who were doing at-home options may have sort of stopped or they've gone back to the restaurant. And, you know, we were really, I really believe in like the masterclass and what we were doing. So, you know, we've sort of refined it to where it is right now. And I feel like one, it's yeah, sort of better than ever. And two, it's been able, you know, it's got legs to really go into the future. So just explain to people what is, how is it different from like anyone's uh, meal delivery? Okay. So yeah, like if I, if I was to explain the masterclass, basically what it is, is it's like a three nights in a row of cooking a dish that we suggest from a different cuisine. So each week we pick a different country. So for example, we're off to Persia next week. So we'll put three different dishes on the menu. And now we also offer a bit more choice because we did find that people, not everyone, you know, everyone has different dietaries or, you know, whatever they want to eat different things and that's fine. So people will choose their box, then we send them the ingredients and then the main three dishes come with videos and then all the other dishes and those come with recipe cards. And then people will sort of be at home and they'll cook the dish and, you know, it's very sort of family friendly, which is a big plus, I think, for us. Um, Where I think a lot of the other style of um of takeaway was probably a bit more like what the restaurant is and cooking maybe their food at home so where we probably differentiate ourselves is we're more probably like you know weeknight dinners and in the supermarket style space as opposed to being like a restaurant um takeaway or restaurant experience at home and it's cooking as well so i guess it's got that you know that um like marley spoon that it's in that space absolutely Everything from here, yeah, everything sort of from scratch, um, you know, really good ingredients, simple ingredients as well. Like, you know, I think that's where it's also really sort of struck a chord with our with our customers is that people are like, okay, I've learned to make this, this dish and they're like, now that's part of my repertoire because they actually learned to make the dish. It's really interesting, you know, because in a way it seems so different to what you have been doing at Atlas Dining, which is – yeah, it's set menu. It's a it's a very uh, uh, what's the word like? It's a concept that demands a lot from you and your team because you not only change the menu but you completely change the cuisine a few times a year. Um, but that's, I guess, you know, it's a fine dining setting. Like you book in advance. It's something that it's pretty adult. Um, and this is really different because it's that it's that weeknight cooking it's not that expensive it's for the whole family but i guess it it does link to what you've been doing at the restaurant with that um you know dancing around the world in terms of the different cuisines and i suppose uh sharing what you learn about you know flavor profiles and techniques from cuisines around the world yeah and i think that like the one thing that really connected for us i think from the start is that like as a restaurant you know, the people who love Atlas and who, you know, support it and get behind it, they really love what we do. And that's, you know, obviously food and travel and cooking different cuisines. And, you know, I think that when we started, people maybe thought we were going to be like very authentic with the cuisines. I think over time they've realized that we just want to serve, you know, what our interpretation of that cuisine is without being too, you know, being too authentic or, you know, being too, um, so yeah, saying exactly what we think. We just want to make something we think is really tasty and, and pays a little bit of homage to that cuisine. And I think with the masterclass and probably the reason it was and has been so successful is that we were able to do that and offer what our brand stands for, but in a different way. And I think that's why it really connected with people. So, you know, staying really true to our concept and really true to sort of what we're known for. Mm. And, I mean, it's incredible to think that you expanded your business so much during a pandemic and to to have like how many staff did you have when you started it was like 20 or so uh no so at atlas we would have had 11 i believe and yeah we had it yeah at 65 um during the pandemic so yeah and we've now got about 30 i mean did you feel weird that it was such a like difficult time for so many people and yet you were doing so well like, look, it definitely, like it was, it was hard and it was definitely, there's a, there's a lot of, I have a lot of different feelings towards it in a way. Like I feel like, I feel very proud that 
we were able to sort of literally hire 65 people who all wouldn't have had jobs who were from, you know, different countries who, you know, so that's a real benefit. I do feel like obviously, you know, that's sorriness of, you know, seeing a lot of hospitality businesses say now, you know, in April, May, June, who have been closing or, you know, having their final days because I think that the, you know, end ending of sort of the, job keeper or those sort of things may have um, triggered that or they may have been you know just running to to that to sort of finish now so you know it's obviously sad to like it's hard to celebrate a success when you know you know that other people haven't had that success so but I do think that also like you know I do think that when you work really hard and like you know I've, I've honestly would go as far as saying I never thought I worked harder than during that whole lockdown like people ask me like what was lockdown like and like I, all I remember is basically there was no traffic on the way to work at 9am or on the way home at about 1am yeah it was super busy yeah so I don't yeah definitely um but yeah it's definitely it was a yeah it's a weird time for sure it, I mean, there does seem to be something about you that just makes you try stuff and then, like, it goes really well. Because how old were you when you opened Atlas? I was 22 when we opened the restaurant. That's pretty young. And, I, I mean, I remember when it opened, it was like, whoa, this concept is is intense. And who is this guy? Like, he's so young and obviously so ambitious. And then you just did it and... It just went really well and you kept going with the concept. Nothing got watered down. And then you've done this new thing, which is um, also, you know, been really extraordinary and innovative. I mean, what is it in you that uh, that makes you do this kind of stuff? Um, like I think that when we initially launched the restaurant, I was just like I really believed in the idea of like the sort of the changing cuisines. And I am very passionate, obviously, about travelling the world. And I thought, you know, to be able to actually – you know, leave your passion, which is obviously food and travel, but inside a, a business, like there's not really much more you can ask for. And that's what like really started the restaurant. And that's why I was sort of so like gung ho and, and keen to do it. And that's why, you know, I'm prepared to work, you know, very, very big hours and stuff. And, and to also, of course, have those hard lessons <laughs> along the way. Like, don't get me wrong. It hasn't been that easy. Um, yeah, I think that's – it's just that I have a real desire to actually, you know, follow my my real passions and I think that that desire, you know, helps me um, – you know, helps me stay very motivated and helps me, you know, want to make it make it work. Mm. And, I mean, this business, there's a lot of tech involved with the masterclasses side of things. Like how has that – how have you sort of absorbed that into what you do? So with the um, – yeah, with the tech side of it, I'm very, um, very lucky. My business partner, who's my brother, and um, and his girlfriend, also fiance, I should say now, which is very exciting. Um, they have a lot more idea about you know how to, whether it's you know setting up the website, working with the different um, you know different companies that we've obviously employed to create the website, and um, you know working with Shopify or whatever we're trying to do. So they have been really, really instrumental in getting that all set up and, and also like the logistics of the business and stuff. So in, I suppose, re, like truthfully, I suppose I do a lot more of the food and the creativity part. And then I'm very lucky to have that sort of, you know, great support who can come up with those, you know, to come up with who do we use for the website? How do we do it? What's it going to look like? All those questions. Cause as you know, you can't do it all, but um, I think that working with, you know, very, very good people helps a lot. Mm, it's crucial. I guess anyone in hospitality would say that, yeah, you, you need an amazing team. And I guess this is an extension of, yeah, a hospitality business. Um, it, it, how is it going? Like, I mean, the restaurant's obviously reopened. Like, how is the restaurant going now? How is how are masterclasses going? Like, have you noticed, is there been much of a downturn? Is it staying steady? Where are things at? So for the restaurant, I think that um, and I, know, I know a lot of other hospitality people, and this is probably the big topic at the moment, it was initially when we reopened, it was really just building the, you know, rebuilding the team. So it's like, you know, if we wanted to, say, expand into more nights, it's like, okay, cool, let's, um, you know, we'd like to hire, say, an extra person on the floor or an extra chef. Like I found that getting the staff and stuff, like once everything reopened at once was quite difficult. But then I found the customer demand of like is very, very positive. So people are like really, really wanting to go out. 
So I think that a lot of places, including us for a little, especially for a little bit there, like it was trying to like, how do you almost balance the demand with, you know, having a sustainable team that's not working stupid hours or doing anything wrong. Sure. And what, yeah. And what about masterclasses? Has that um, stayed steady? Yeah, definitely stayed steady. We found that we found that the peak was definitely during the second lockdown last year and then over Christmas, which is once, you know, once people started to go away and stuff, naturally we were not going to see as many orders. And then steadily this year, you know, besides the week of Easter, we've found that each week it's just growing and growing and growing. So I think that, you know, maybe for us being, you know, at home, at home midweek meals, people, you know, coming into the colder months maybe aren't looking to go out as much. So they're more, you know, want to maybe have an experience at home or they want to maybe, you know, just they just like cooking at home, which is nothing wrong with that. Well, I think it's also people are getting back into, well, things are getting busier. Like, I mean, I ordered, I ordered it last week because I was just like, oh, my God, you know, I've got one kid doing footy training, you know, my husband's back in the office. It's just like there's a lot more coming and going. And just to, yeah, I, I think I'm going to find a, bit, a level of, comfort from it knowing I've got a few easy meals just sitting there in the fridge like that I can whip up or I can tell one of the kids to do it's exactly right and like I think that's where for us because we are doing sort of that cooking at home and it is ingredients like it is very open you know what I mean and like what exactly what you just said like that you feel very like that comfort in knowing that you have that say in your fridge and you can you know, that's maybe three meals a week that you may have prepared for your whole family that you don't have to really think about, you know, it's already organized. So I think that's where we've, where our sort of concept's very strong is that, you know, people just generally, you know, families, they're they're always going to eat. So, you know, if it stops, you may be going to buy it from the, I don't know, the supermarket. Instead, you just get it delivered and it's, you know, very similar price. It's maybe it just makes a lot of sense. Mm, Yeah. Um, I was uh, interviewed Shane Delia last week um, about Provador, and he said that forty percent of customers interacted with a restaurant for the first time through his um, delivery service. So, someone orders from Flower Drum, forty percent of those people they've never been to Flower Drum, and you know a lot of them are then inspired to actually visit the restaurant next time that you know they want to I don't know celebrate something or they want to head to the city whatever it is have you found people your masterclass customers have then visited the restaurant 100% yes I definitely agree with that like we have um yeah like naturally when I'm when I'm always at the restaurant I love you know speaking to people and you know just you just get chatting and it, a lot of the conversations start with oh, you know, our friend recommended us to do a masterclass. We did that. We loved it. And then now we've come and, you know, tried the restaurant. Like I've, I think that's very, very true. And um, and I think that's even more reason why, you know, I feel very lucky that we initially just, just started something because it does keep our brand very relevant. This episode of Dirty Linen is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter, like this is the sort of butter butter makers will, would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and and get the flavor into it you know the natural fermentation that gets all the flavors into the cream and then once you churn it you end up with this really rich flavorsome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well for more information go to pepisaya.com.au Charlie, you, you said that you know what you do at Atlas with the different cuisines. It's it's a it's a an, it's an homage to the countries that you're um, representing. It's not you're not trying to be authentic or yeah, really do the cuisine. Um, can you talk about how you think about that? Because you know, there's always this question when um, people who aren't from a cuisine do it. It's like you know, is it appropriation? Is it okay? Um, you know, how do you sort of conceive of that? Yes, very, very good question. Um, so, look, yeah, I think o- over time I've, you know, when, when I started, like naturally like any 22-year-old, very naive and you just think 
like, <laughs> you know, the world your oyster. And I think as we've gone on, I've really, um, you know, I've done a lot of trips now to different places. I've really started to like work out that I love to sort of see what inspires me mainly about, yeah, whether it's the people, the place, culture, something I've eaten and really like focusing on those ideas and trying to not necessarily like one reinvent the wheel or two try and claim any ownership of anything because it's it's not you can't obviously so i think that um you know we try and every time you know we talk to our guests we're talking to you know our messaging we just try and explain that you know everything's very inspired by it and i think for me that's made it really an exciting way to look at it because we can use inspiration from any of those things i mentioned before without necessarily saying that like this is this which of course will and understandably offend someone Mm. so what's an example of one of the cuisines and and can you just talk through that process in a bit more detail like is it ingredients is it cooking methods is it a place like how what's the specific thing that you've been inspired by okay i reckon um yeah like i reckon when i was in like when i was in korea for example like when you go say to any of the restaurants and they put the band chans on the table so they'll just continuously serve say lots of little dishes as you're sort of eating like i thought that like way of eating was just so epic and that's what we wanted to do with our korean menu so as we'd serve the menu we'd be using the band chans and like the band chans would have been anything um you know we we're working with this really awesome farm so we basically just said to them send us whatever you have and then we'll just make it into something and like that to me was like it felt very like I don't know it felt like we were giving the experience that I received when I was in Korea but we're doing it in a way that's not claiming any ownership over the idea of a banchan and serving them like that if that makes sense yeah I love that and when I travel you know in the olden days when we were allowed to travel um, I mean I usually go there with like a focus dish or ingredient or yeah just something that I want to be really obsessed with and dig into so well I went the last trip I did was to Mumbai and I got I was just like I want to do I want to eat everything and try to understand as much as I can about chickpeas and whether you know chickpeas in a curry or chickpeas um you know with the, with the base and flour made into to breads and sauces and and um yeah all that it just it's just give me anything to do with chickpeas and there was so much and it's such an interesting well I just found it so interesting to explore the creativity and res- and resourcefulness of a cuisine through that one ingredient I mean do you sort of geek out on things like that yeah like when I was in Israel like obviously with all the different tahini like going getting very obsessed with tahini like almost as obsessed as all the Israelis are with it putting it almost in every single dish <laughs> And like that, yeah. that to me was like a full like wow moment. Like we went to this place in Jerusalem where they actually had like a stone grinder and then they had an oven where they were toasting the sesame, then they were grinding it. Like that to me was like just mind blowing. And then to see the process and then to be able to taste it, how the, you know, sesame is used or tahini is used throughout the whole cuisine. Like that was really, really epic. Mm. And then how, does that translate? into how you could think about ingredients in other cuisines? Um, yes, I think so, some are like really, really obvious. Like Vietnam, you know, you can think of, say, fish sauce or, you know what I mean, lots of, say, Korea, you think of a lot of fermented foods. Like there is definitely usually, in especially in some of those cuisines that we all love, there's usually one or two like key ingredients or things that, you know, really make that cuisine. Like it doesn't taste the same without it. So I feel like, yeah, every time, like every trip I've done, like you start to, I agree with that, like you do get a little bit obsessed with something that you probably thought was very stock standard before. Yeah. But you start to understand like what it actually does to the dish and how it makes it just so incredible. I think it's also, I think for me it's like you're never anywhere long enough, you know, as long as you want to be, that you can really explore the breadth of a cuisine um but I think I think it's like it's also how I approach going to galleries you know it's like you can never spend as much time looking at anything um and certainly you can't look at everything so my approach to going to a gallery is just like stare at one painting for like a really long time and maybe do just pick a few things and just try to go a bit deep because otherwise I just get overwhelmed and feel like I'm not experiencing anything properly yeah, I really agree with that. And like, 
and that's where we've sort of you know it's like how do they how do we then bring that back to the restaurant and then yeah tell that story and then bring you know our guests on that journey with us of course without trying to you know without making any false claims or you know offending anyone in any way like you know not the not that we ever really have don't get me wrong but it's you know i'm really careful of that because you know it would i would be very offended if someone came in and said like oh you've completely bastardized this cuisine or you've done this like which is really offensive because it's like you, you know we'd never have that sort of purpose so i'm very yeah you've got to be you know you want to be really careful and you and you also have to also be so careful to you know be respectful of you know other cultures you know you at the end of the day you you know you're taking you know using something that is you know from their heritage and it's like how do you do it in a really tasteful way where everyone wins mm, totally so i know charlie that when you've developed menus in the past your mode has been you go to a place you travel around you you know geek out get inspired and then come back that's obviously pretty tricky at the moment so how are you developing your new menus for atlas yeah, so we're, we're definitely serving Australian cuisine at the moment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's probably my, my answer. Um, it could be indefinitely. Um, look, I'd love to, to be honest, I'm very optimistic that there, hopefully there'll be a travel bubble to Singapore at some point this year, which would definitely make our next cuisine Singapore. Mm. And I think, um, yeah, just like everyone, everyone else, it's just, you know, you just have to roll with it. Like I would absolutely be so... Like, yeah, I, I was thinking about this the other day, like the idea of like just going traveling somewhere. You know, this is, I've got back just before the previous lockdown from India myself. And, um, you know, it's, I've been working very hard over the last sort of year and a little bit. And it's just one of those things that like, yeah, just the idea of going somewhere for, even if it was a week and, you know, being able to immerse myself, learn something, new ideas, bit of fresh energy, like it would be incredible. We just took it so for granted, didn't we? Oh my god! <laughs> yes, yeah. I feel very silly now, to be honest, because yeah, it's just the idea of you know just being able to, like, yeah, you know, this click of a button, go, oh, let's just go here. You know, this is this sounds cool. Like that's just a really abstract idea now, isn't it? It's yeah. Ah, oh, we were so lucky, and we will be again. And um, you, you, I mentioned optimism. You said you're optimistic. Let's talk more about that. Like, what are you optimistic about for um, the way that we eat, about um, Australian restaurants? Where, where, what do you think is good? What do I think is good? Um, I definitely, that's a great question. I definitely think there's a lot of like really, I think there's a lot of really interesting food, um, things happening in Australia, especially, you know, some really awesome, you know, up and coming chefs and up and coming restaurants who are just like, you know, really grabbing the bull by the horns and doing some really cool things. I'm really, I'm really passionate, especially recently about really simple foods. And I feel that, um, you know, like the more I go out and eat, like you start to see places that are getting really focused on like really good ingredients, keeping it really basic, two or three things on a plate. And that to me, I'm get really excited about. Um, I'm very passionate about, <laughs> I'm very passionate about Chinese food, but that's a little bit off topic. <laughs> just has to be thrown in. You can be optimistic about that and excited about Chinese food. God, just, I mean, that's, more, you know, many lifetimes of exploration to be done there. Oh, yeah. And then um, and then I think, yeah, I'm just, I am generally optimistic. I think that the one, you know, silver lining, I think, of COVID for, for most people, especially, um, you know, people who, you know, run, you know, whether hospitality businesses, catering businesses or you know, anything, I think, food-related, really, they've all probably been, in this situation where they're like, we never predicted that could happen, but we had to do something. And I feel like I hear so many success stories out of like, you know, oh, we started doing this and now we keep doing it. Or, you know, we um, pivoted to this on online or we did takeaway, we did this. And people actually have like learned new things. And I think that's really, you know, that's pretty special considering that, you know, last year, March, it was like the whole world's going to end. People really realized how creative and resilient they were didn't they yeah definitely and like and i think that like if you can be creative in hospitality and like in food i think that it's like it's the ultimate industry i don't think there's a better like there's a better industry to be in if you know if you can be really creative and you can be you know and you can obviously it involves a lot of hard work too like food is always hard work you know because there's so many moving parts and you know maintaining quality and freshness and all those 
you know, those aspects. But I think that, you know, that uh, from, yeah, I'm very optimistic that there's so many great ideas out there that are slowly like coming to fruition. And I think we'll start to see a bit more of a, like, you know, it's not just going to be just restaurants and chefs anymore. It could be, you know, restaurants and entrepreneurs and, you know, even a lot of cool things happening in the beverage space and with the wine world, like, you know, it's getting pretty creative and interesting out there. Yeah, that's such an interesting way to look at it because it's like you say it's hard because there are so many moving parts, there's so many elements to a food business, but I suppose it seems like what you're also saying is because there are so many moving parts, you can be so creative in the way that you, you put them all together and you, and you can really innovate. Is that what you're saying? A hundred percent. And I think that, um, yeah, and I think because people just like, it's such a need to eat, like, you know, you have to, you know, everyone has to eat. Like, I think that, you know, the market's always there and people, people do actually really love getting behind like a good idea or a new concept or, you know, or trying something new. And I think that, you know, just like with, touching on with like us wanting to go traveling it's you know it's that whole experience of having a new experience or something different or that and i think that when that's applied to say the food space as well where something's new or different or unique people just they just uh, you know it's like a magnet they really just go straight to it Mm. and staffing is the thing you mentioned it everybody's talking about it it's just a bloody struggle what do you think is going to be the thing or the things that starts to ease that situation? Um, that's a really good question. I think, um, like, you know, naturally, and, you know, it's always been the case, especially at Atlas, that all our staff, well, not all, but most of our staff um, are from overseas. And I think that, you know, overseas, they're, like hospitality is a really big career choice where in Australia it's not really as simply viewed as a career choice as much, although, you know, it definitely is a great career. There's nothing wrong with working in hospitality, but I don't, it doesn't have the same sort of maybe the level of training or, you know, a lot of people go to the hospitality school or hotel schools in different parts of the world, you know, especially Europe. So I think that naturally a lot of say once the borders do start to reopen to people doing working holiday visas, student visas, they will start to fill a lot of positions and then I hope, um, and I hope that people just maybe just generally wanting to sort of get back into the kitchen, get back on to working on the floor. Like I think a lot of people at the start of the pandemic may have gone into other roles. So they may have been working as a, as a chef or working in the front of house and they might have thought, you know, that job's way too insecure because a lockdown means I won't have any work. So now I'm going to go work in an office. I'm going to go work in, you know, wherever, warehouse or whatever job so i think that maybe those people who did switch sort of careers will hopefully see that you know things are not looking like they're going to be locked down again so they might want to come back to the industry because it's got that you know really great job security again why did you go into uh kitchen life um the reason i went into it i just really well obviously i had the i had a real passion for food of course but i actually really was inspired by just the sort of like the actual work of it, I feel like it's a great career choice because there's always something new to learn. Like you can actually literally not ever know everything about food. So that's a pretty, you know, it just keeps it exciting in that respect because I feel that I'm one of the people I really like to be challenged or excited or I like to learn. And I feel, I felt like maybe there's some other careers that, you know, you, you may not know at all, but it's not as probably creative or as interesting to keep learning where with food like I know for example every time I go to a different even restaurant in Melbourne or I go overseas or something like you learn something or see something for the first time it's always like wow that's that's cool and and I'm very glad I realized that at a young age Mm, that's why I love it too that's one of the reasons anyway it's just it no you're never going to know everything and every day you can learn like five things yeah and you just get to like talk to someone about food and they'll like say something that you're like up until now I like believe that the complete opposite was true and then they've changed your mind because of this reason or like it's always but it's such a good yeah it's I don't know I find that the conversation around food's always very interesting and there's just you know naturally everyone's from different parts of the world so everyone's got you know what their understanding of it is and then I don't know it keeps a very open 
conversation and I think it's really interesting. Well, that's why it's so good to do a podcast about food. So <laughs> thank you for <laughs> being part of this conversation, Charlie. It's um, really, really great to have you on the show as we talk optimism and things going well. But, yeah, thanks so much for sharing your perspective with us today. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, uh, really pleased you, you know, wanted to have a chat. Definitely. It was great. And I can't wait for my masterclass box next week. I'm going to enjoy cooking. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Look forward to you trying our beautiful Persian cuisine. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Danny. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production. (laughs) 